Galatians chapter 3. But Paul has, has reached the point where he's going to begin to address the Galatians and what they're doing. In fact, he's, he says in verse 1 in chapter 3, they're, Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. And the word foolish there is empty-headed. That's what it means. But it means on purpose. They've chosen to be ignorant and chosen to neglect what, they've been, what they already were taught and known as the truth. They're, it's not, not foolish like they didn't know. It's foolish like they've abandoned the truth for the religion that the Judaizers are bringing. You know, Paul and, and Titus and some of the others, Barnabas and all, who would have been through there, they, they already had told them and had, had given them the clear gospel that Jesus Christ died for our sin. He's the perfect sacrifice, the atonement for our sin. It's what you need as Gentiles. This was, this was nothing, there was no teaching from the apostles, no teaching from Paul that you had to convert to Judaism. You didn't have to get circumcised. You didn't have to begin to observe all the feast days. You didn't have to do any of that. You, know, you didn't have to go to the temple even before the temple was destroyed. You didn't have to go to the temple and start bringing sacrifices to the temple. Jesus was their sacrifice. That was it. You didn't have to be a Jew to be a Christian. But, and again, the, these other people had come from Jerusalem, come like they were coming with authority from the church in Jerusalem and trying to put these kind of things on the people and, and say, you have to do this, you have to do that. It's not just Jesus, it's Jesus and this. And, and there's too much of that even today. That, that is something we have battled. I mean, you think about it. This was a, a pretty, pretty fast thing to come into the church. You're not that far removed from the crucifixion. You're not that far removed from the day of Pentecost. You're not that far removed from, from the, the Holy Spirit falling on the house of Cornelius. All of the things in the book of Acts, you're not, you're not far from the birth of the church, and you're already having to deal with it becoming a religion instead of a relationship with Jesus. And Paul be, begins to battle that right away. He even had to confront Peter on these things. We saw in, in chapter 2 that he had come to visit, and while he was there, everything was great with the Gentiles. In fact, the, the, the truth of the gospel came through Peter to the Gentiles first. But he's there, and, and then some more people came from the church in Jerusalem, and before these others came from, from Jerusalem, he was eating with the Gentiles and going in their house, and everything was fine, hanging out with them. But as soon as these guys come to town, you know, all of a sudden the pressure's on and, and he begins to separate himself from the Gentiles. He's not eating with them anymore. He's worried about what he's eating and, and, and all the other stuff. And, you know, it, it's, the same, it's the same thing still today. This religion creeps in over and over again all the time, every day. And listen, it can be from any direction. And, we, and we've talked about that. It can be, you know... Whether you're a church that is hymns only and suit and tie, and if you don't, well, then you're not giving your best to the Lord, so you're already out of bounds. You need to have your hair cut and, you know, everything else. Or you can go to a church that is, well, we're just laid back, man, T-shirts, sandals, whatever. We don't do a whole lot. We're not, you know. And if you wear a tie, either one will make the other one feel completely uncomfortable. And if you're doing that, I mean, if somebody walked in here and came in and they were all dressed up and, and somebody went up to them and said, why are you so dressed up? Man, we don't wear ties here. You need to take that thing off. That's just as religious as walking into one of their churches and say, here's your tie before you go sit down. It, it, either one of those blocks the other person from the love of Jesus Christ. We have to be careful. We have to be very careful of that. Now, you know, it... This book and, and, uh, and some of the other teachings in the New Testament, it gets kind of hard, I think, sometimes for people to, to go and say, well, if I'm not under the law, I'm saved by grace, then I can do whatever I want, right, after that. I can do anything I want to. But Paul himself is very clear. You, you, you can't just do whatever you want to. 
But listen, it's salvation. It's that relationship with Jesus Christ, that open, free, worshipful relationship that causes us to have a desire to do good works. But good works is not dietary. Good works is not, is not the way you dress, what your building looks like. You know, do you have enough stained glass? Do you have a steeple? If you have a steeple, you're religious. If you don't have a steeple, you know, like, and, and, and listen, I, I actually for five seconds had that conversation with a Calvary Chapel pastor. No, you can't have a steeple on here. It's a Calvary Chapel. We, we were, well, we were driving. And I, said, I said, hey, man, that building would be awesome for a, for a Calvary Chapel, man. It's out here in the middle of no place. And it's an old church building. That big steeple. He's like, can't have that building, man. It's got a steeple on it. You can't have a steeple on the Calvary Chapel. That's religion. I'm like, what you just said is religious. It's just the other end of it. You know, unfortunately for him, he ended up <laughs> sharing a building with another church, and it was huge, and it had his giant, didn't just have a steeple, he had a bell tower. I'm like, good enough for you, buddy. It was funny. So God has a way of getting a hold of those who truly want to follow him but make stupid, stupid statements, don't we? So anyways, we need, to, we need to be careful about extremes. Right? It's balance. It's balance. You know, I, I think after going through and, and, and teaching through most of the books of the law on Wednesday night, and we see God's grace in the law, not, not just... Not just if you look at it, you can you discern God's grace, but you can see God openly talks about his grace in the law. And it's not just a bunch of do's and don'ts and rules and regulations, and if you follow them, then you're my child. It's, there's this, but if you blow it, I make a way for you to restore this relationship with me. And all those sacrifices and all those things that they went through were all pointing to Messiah. They were all pointing to, to Jesus, to their Savior coming. But at the same time, he says over and over in the law, be holy because I'm holy. So there is effort we put into being holy and having good conduct. And that's not an Old Testament law thing. That's in the New Testament too. Paul will say, be holy because your God is holy. Peter will say, be holy because your God is holy. We'll never achieve his holiness. I've said this before, guys, you will never completely love your wife the way Christ loved the church and gave himself for you because you can't, you're not him. But that bar is set so high so that we don't feel like ever we can achieve that without God working in our life toward our wives. Do you understand it? That, that was a big thing for, for me. You wouldn't think that that would be that hard of a revelation for a guy to come up with, but it is. We can't do what God's called us to do without him. All right? So our conduct matters. The things that come out of our mouth matters. As we go through these uh, epistles, we're going to find that these things matter all the way through. But what matters the most, and the only way you're going to get a hold on these things, is if you are focused on Jesus Christ first if you have accepted his grace and his forgiveness in your life for those sins. Otherwise, you will wrestle and you will wrestle and you will try to do good and you'll try to be good enough and it won't ever happen. You can't be good enough to get into heaven. If there was any other way, any other way, if you could be good enough, then Jesus didn't have to die on the cross. Plain and simple. And that's kind of the argument that Paul is making. You guys, even there in verse 1, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. Why are you falling for this stuff? Who is messing with your mind? Who has got you so twisted up in an argument or in whatever they're calling apologetics or whatever it is? Christian deep thinking sometimes gets us into a lot of trouble because... We get away from the simple truth of God's word. There are some, some cool things to find in the Bible. There are some things that he's talked about in time past, in ancient time, that science all of a sudden will prove. You know, the Old Testament talks about God sitting above the circle of the earth. And how long was it before man finally decided, yep, it's round? 
But that, you know, so things like that. That's interesting. That, that, that gives us conversation with God. That, but those things don't work for arguments or for persuasion with non-believers because they don't believe, so they don't comprehend God's word. You can talk about all the different numbers in the Bible and what they mean, and the number is the number of per- completion or perfection or, or, or whatever. They don't get it because they don't understand. They don't know any Hebrew significance to it. They don't know any biblical significance to it because it's, it is opened up to us by the power of the Holy Spirit in our life to understand. And if you don't have him, you know, you, you don't go out and talk about this. Listen, I've tried. I've tried prophecies that have been specifically fulfilled, dates and everything else. And it's not impressive to them. Not even, not in the least. We could find Noah's Ark, put up a sky lift all the way up to it, have tours and everything else, and they still, nobody would believe. People still wouldn't believe. I mean, it could say Noah and family right on the, engraved in the wood, and they still wouldn't believe. They're not going to believe. They're, they're, they would find or try to come up with some other crazy explanation for what it is. Or they would just be outright defiant against God. And listen, more and more today we see that. More and more today. It's just outright defiance of God. Paul would address the fact that they are not just children of Abraham because they're, they're, they're Jewish, because they're circumcised. That was the, that was the argument. To, you know, the, the promise was through Abraham. So to be a true believer, a true Christian, you have to, you have to be circumcised. Abraham circumcised his whole family, just like God called him to do. He called him out of a... Well, when Abraham was called, Abraham wasn't Jewish. Abraham's never considered Jewish. He's never called a Jew. The father of the Jews. But he's not Jewish. Isaac technically was not Jewish. This didn't start until after Jacob and he had his 12 sons and they, God changed his name to Israel and began to establish them and really not until after the captivity in Egypt, when they go back in the land and they inhabit the land. Then they're Israel as a nation. Then they are Jewish. But before that, man, Abraham's a nomad, idol-worshiping fool. All kinds of idols where he came from. He wasn't sitting there worshiping God and, and then God spoke to him. Called him out of the Ur of the Chaldees, the, the place where all these idols were. Multiple, multiple idols. But look at verse 5. says, therefore he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by works of the law or by hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Now that would make some Jewish people mad. If you don't believe the way Abraham did, if you don't have the faith that Abraham had, which came 400 plus years before the law, he was declared righteous by God. He wasn't declared righteous because he followed the law. He was declared righteous here because he believed. He wasn't declared righteous because he wore a suit and tie and sang hymns. He wasn't declared righteous because he wore you know, Hawaiian shirts and sandals and, and played contemporary music or because he played in a Christian rock band. He was declared righteous because he believed. And it's the same thing for all of us. We're not declared righteous because we like the things that God likes. We're declared righteous because we n- decide, we know, we make the decision. We understand, we need a Savior. 
We understand that we are dead in our sin. And when that understanding comes and we make the choice to follow him, we make the choice to ask for forgiveness of our sins, to repent of our sin. And that's different than confession. Repenting is turning around and going the other way, leaving it behind, not dragging it with you. You're free. He, he's done this to give us freedom, not to, not to just chain the past to us and drag it with you all the way through life. And, and you know, that's not repentance. Turn around going the other way and dragging it with you is not repentance either. You know, it, it's walking away from it, living differently. You know, sometimes we get so wrapped up in our testimonies and we've got to dig them up and dig them up and dig them up and dig them up and we, we th- pretty soon we're, we're joking about them and we're laughing about them and, what, you know, yeah, I remember when I did this and I remember. Well, you know what? Lost people do the same thing about their past. Right. We'll be different about it. I know what God saved me out of. Right. And I'll, I'll be general about it, but I'm not, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of specifics about my past, really to be honest with you. Unless God leads me to do that one-on-one with somebody, I'm not doing it anymore. I left that behind. I'm not here because I used to do drugs. I'm, not here, be- I'm here because I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Amen. So we have to believe. We have to have the faith that Abraham had. And if we do, then we're sons of Abraham. You're a son or daughter of Abraham because you believed like he believes or believed. Verse 8 in the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in in you all nations uh, shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed are blessed with believing Abraham. You're blessed with Abraham. Because he knew that this was going to come to the Gentiles also, and not just to the Jews, he went to Abraham before he was Jewish. 400 years before he gave him the law, before the law was given to Israel through Moses. Verse says, is for as many as as are of the works of the law, are under the curse. For it is written, Curse is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. That's in Deuteronomy. If you're going to make this religious, you better toe the line every single detail of the law. Not break a single thing. You can't break any of it. Or you're under the curse. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. That's in in Habakkuk. It's going to get quoted in Romans too. It's going to get quoted, quoted in Hebrews. The just shall live by faith, not by the law. Because you can't live by the law. So you have to believe in a God who's going to actually forgive you of your sin when you ask him. That's going to empower you to keep walking away from it when you repent. One who loved you enough to send his son to die for you because you couldn't do this on your own. The just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So the law is not of faith. The man who does them should live by them. You set up rules and regulations for your house and how the household's going to run with your kids. What you expect of your children. Do you also live by them yourself? Or are you above the law because you're the one that laid down the law? 
Yeah, your kids will throw that in your face every time. They become great little lawyers. They will take your law and tear it apart and throw it right in your face. So what's your answer to them? Oh, no, no, no. You live by my law. I live by faith. I can do whatever I want because I'm the dad. I live by faith. No. No. Christ has redeemed us. He paid the price. And this is a, uh, the kind of redeeming that you would do when you would buy a slave. So you would buy slaves for different reasons in their culture. You, 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 well, you might become a slave because you're indentured to somebody. You, in other words, you owe them a, a debt that you can't pay, so you go and you become their slave for a time. And when the debt's worked off, then you're set free. Or you might just buy a slave and, and, and put them to work for you. But this is buying a slave for the purpose of setting them free. That's what the word redeemed means. We weren't just bought with a price. We were bought for the purpose of being set free. That's why Paul would say, I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ. He set me free, but I want to stay and be a servant. That's what a bond slave did, or a bond servant. It was time for them to be free. Time for them to go and do their thing. Be on their own. But they loved their master enough they didn't want to leave, so they decided to stay. Now, once you became a bond slave, there was no more day of freedom to look forward to. You went to the doorpost, they drove an all through your ear, they put a ring in there, marked you as that person's slave for the rest of your life. Now, you probably had different responsibilities than the one who was bought off the auction block. You would be a slave that would be allowed to go and do business for his master. You would be a slave that maybe ran the house, raised the kids. You, you, would, it, you would be more like family. Your master would take care of you even better than he did before, probably. But the reality of it is Jesus went to the cross to be the curse for us. That's what he says next. So he redeemed us. Paid that price to redeem us from the curse of the law, having become a, a, having become a curse for us. For it is written, "Cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree." When you say, "Well, Jesus didn't hang on the tree; he was a you know cross made out of wood," but well, actually, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's written on one of the scrolls because crucifixion was becoming a way of death. It was when, it was when the verse was written that he's quoting here, crucifixion wasn't a way of death. But at the writing of this particular scroll that was found with the Dead Sea Scrolls, they had interpreted that scripture as also applying to one who had been crucified. Because usually you were crucified to put shame to you. It wasn't, and, and the Jews, their, their way of of dying or, or putting someone to death was stoning to death. It wasn't crucifying them. So you're under the curse. You're, you, death on the tree, Jesus, because he hung on the cross, became a curse for us. Became a curse. He took on the sin of the world. And not took on like some of my charismatic brothers and sisters like to make it and and beat it all down and stomped on it and whatever else and kicked in the gates of hell and sat there for three days and then came back out when he wanted to. That's not what he did. He took on, for only a few hours on the cross, the wrath of God on him. Didn't take it on like challenged it. Didn't take on the curse like challenged it. Let it be put upon him. He paid for you. He didn't beat it into submission and make it of no effect. He took it on and he endured it for us so that we don't have to. That cross is our cross. The wrath of God belongs on us. But he went and he endured that for us. Then he took his life back. 
In fact, I believe that after that, I mean, he takes on the wrath on the cross. Then he gives up his life. Then he goes, where did he, he tell the other thief on the cross he was going to go? It's paradise, right? You're going to be with me today in paradise. The price was already paid. He didn't sit in hell for three days getting tormented and tortured. Right. He went and spent time with the saints that had gone before. And when he came out, he came out. Verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That's how you receive the promise of the Spirit, through faith, through believing in Him. Trusting. See, faith isn't just believing. Faith is trusting. It's trusting in God. You trust Him with your life. Do you trust him with your sin? When you, when you place your sin in front of him and say, this is my sin, I'm sorry, I repent, I want to leave it. Do you trust him with that? That he really wants that? Do you trust him that he really wants that relationship with you, to care for you, to take care of you, to, to, to provide for you, to be all the different names of God for you? Or are there aspects in your life that you're going to hang on to and, and i got to make this happen? This is little one. This is just little over here. So we're not going to mess with We're not going to bother God with this piece over here. And I'm not going to bother God with this little... Listen, if you don't bother God with the little things, pretty soon you're going to have a big mess anyways. He wants it all. You trust Him with everything. Or are you keeping it to yourself? Because I'm telling you, if you're holding on to it yourself, you're in trouble. You're not going to be able to do it. You're back under the law. You're back under the curse. Trying to do it of your own power. It's not how it's to be done. Verse 15, Brethren, I speak in a manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls it or adds to it. So if you make a promise between men or you, you have a legal document that makes a promise and it, it's between you, it, it's your legal document, it's your, let's say it's your will. You pronounce in your will what you have and, and who you want to get those things. How it's all going to be divided up when you're gone. So here, nobody gets to annul that. Once you're dead, it's it, Right? Nobody gets to know it. Nobody gets to change it. Nobody gets to add to it but you before you die. Nobody gets to take away from it. You're the only one that can do that. And the Roman system was very similar to ours. It was the same thing for them. They were all legal documents, promises, things sealed up. Nobody could change it but the person who wrote it. So how is it that we think that you know, if, if the just shall live by faith, a man can add to that? Or a man can take away from God's grace. That we can only apply it, or that we, could, we get to apply it to whoever, whenever we want. That's, again, back to legalism. Verse 16, now to Abraham and his seed, that singular seed, where the promise is made. He does not say to seeds as of many, but as one, and to your seed, who is Christ. So when he made the promises to Abraham, the promises were to Abraham that the seed, the one, was coming through him. He's taking Abraham back to the Garden of Eden, Right? There's going to be enmity between your seed and the seed of the woman, he said to the serpent. You're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. Gets more specific with Abraham. This is your seed. It's coming through you, Abraham. I mean, again, as we go through, through the time of the children of Israel in the wilderness after they left Egypt, 
There's been a few times where God has said, that's it, I'm done. I'm going to wipe them all out and I'm going to make, we're going to start over with you, Moses. Moses is like, oh no. No, 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 no. And, and where we're at now in Numbers, we're on the verge of them going in. And, and Reuben and Gad come to Moses and say, hey, we're going to take our inheritance on this side of the Jordan. And Moses is going, are you crazy? We've done this before. You remember the 12 guys I sent in before? And they came back and they, 10 of them give a bad report and turn the heart of, of the children of Israel away. And God put them in the, none of that generation is left except for Joshua and Caleb. Moses already knows at that point, he's not going in. Nobody's, Aaron's dead. Nobody who was at, of that generation was going to go into the promised land. And he says to him, if you stay here, you're going to turn them again, and God's going to bring destruction on them again. You're going to discourage them by not going in. And they say, hey, listen, we'll go in with them. We'll send all of our military guys in. Just let us build cities so our families and our, and our livestock are all protected. It's a good place for livestock. That's why we want to be out here. Let us build these cities so that they can be protected, and we will go and we'll fight with the rest of the tribes and clear out the land. Well, that puts Moses at ease a little bit. But you see, Moses, I'm not doing another 40 years. God's already told me, I get to go ga be gathered to my fathers. I'm not, I'm not doing, you're not turning these people around again and I have to do another 40 years. I'm not doing it. And there were times when, when Moses was just like, kill me, I'm done with these people. Right? God says, no, nah, I'm not killing you. I'm, gonna make it, I'm killing all of them. We're going to start over with you. They had these talks together. They had a relationship with one another, you think? It, it's, it was singular. It was, it was just going, I don't even know how I got into that, but it was fun. Um, <laughs> one seed, one seed, one person, one way from the garden, there was going to be one way to be redeemed. One person coming. And Abraham believed in that person. Abraham believed in him. In fact, Jesus would tell the Pharisees that Abraham saw my day and rejoiced in it. Well, how did Abraham see your day? That was even the church. Abraham, you're not even, you're only a little over 30 years old. How, you're not even as old as we are. How did Abraham see your day? Go back to Genesis 22. Abraham takes Isaac up onto the mountain. It's the first time that there's a mention of lamb. There's a couple other words that are first times in there. Lamb, love, and worship in that chapter. First times they're mentioned in the Bible. Take your son, your only son, who you love, and take him up on the mountain. And sacrificing. They get to the mountain. They take two, two witnesses, with, two young men with them. They got to have two witnesses to what's going on anyways. They get to the mountain. You guys stay here. We'll be back, Abraham said. We will be back. He didn't say, I'll come back. He said, we're going to be back. Abraham already believed before he got there. That God, and, and it was Hebrews that says that Abraham believed that even if he had to, he would raise Isaac from the dead because he had already been promised that the, the seed was coming through Isaac. And he had faith then that God would raise him from the dead. Even if, he, even if God hadn't followed all the way through with this sacrifice. And they're walking up and Isaac is carrying the wood up the hill the son and the father going up to that point of sacrifice together. Listen, on Mount Moriah, the same hill where Jesus would be crucified. Walking up that hill. Isaac says to his dad, where's the, where's the sacrifice? And Isaac sa or Abraham says, God will provide himself the sacrifice. Not provide for himself the sacrifice, but God will provide himself as the sacrifice, as the lamb. They get all the way up there, they go through all the motions, Isaac's on the altar, 
Abraham's ready to stick the knife in. And God stops him. But think about this. I mean, Isaac wouldn't have just been dead, wouldn't have just been run through with a knife. He would have been burned up. Ashes. And Abraham still believed that he could bring him back, that God would bring him back from that to fulfill his promise. Do you believe in the promises that God has made regardless of what you're going through? The promise to be your provider. See, we take a lot of this stuff for granted. We take the promises for granted. And we're very glib about them, very haphazard about them. God's word, we're very just kind of nonchalant about the whole thing, aren't we? Even in our prayers. Hey, God, you know, I've got this problem. Just take care of that for me, will you? And we go on living our life the same old way, and, and, and nothing changes. And nothing's really focused on the problem. And we start making excuses as for why we're not delivered from something, why, why doors aren't being opened, why healing's not coming. We make all these kind of things. Of, of, Excuses for it. We're not living by faith anymore. Not, whether God heals me of something or not doesn't change my, my faith. doesn't change my trust for him. Because I know there are things that will take me through. I understand that. And I don't expect that I'm going to understand as I go through those times why I'm going through them. And it could be I come out on the other side of it and I, and, and I still don't understand why I went through it. Other than it's just a time of sifting and making me stronger for something else. So I get that. But that mentality, sometimes, for me anyways, makes me very nonchalant in my prayer. Just kind of throw up a prayer. Hey, Lord, man, you know this is happening. I got to go. I got, I got these other things I got to do. Take care of that for me. And where's the relationship in that? You like it when your kids do it? Because our kids do it to us all the time. Hey, mom. Hey, dad. Take care of this for me. We, I gotta, I gotta go here. Wash my clothes. I gotta, I gotta run. I gotta go see my boyfriend. I gotta go see my. I'm going out tonight. I'm going out with my friends. It's time for an oil change, mom. You take my car to work with you, so you can drop it off and get the oil change on your way to work. Right? Don't we do that? Hey, take care of my stuff for me. I got something else I got to do. Listen. We can't. We got we to gotta live by faith. And if you're asking God for something... First of all, don't just throw it up there like it's a requirement whether it happens or not. Believe that he's going to do it. But spend time with him talking about these things so you know how to ask. You know what to ask for. And maybe sometimes you don't ever know what to ask. But you know what? What does he promise then? He's given us the Holy Spirit because sometimes we don't know what to pray for. And he prays on our behalf. Sometimes that's what it is. And it's just being quiet. And, and then having enough faith that the Holy Spirit's going to ask for the thing that's going right, to be right for you. I don't know if the Holy Spirit asks. He might ask for something I'm really not looking forward to. I don't, you know. No, he's not. He's going to ask for what's going to be the most beneficial for you. Not necessarily even for you. How about this? Not what's most beneficial for you. I got that wrong. It's what's most honoring and beneficial for God's purpose and His will. How about that? Now you're trusting God if that's how you can pray. I don't care what happens to me. Whatever brings you glory and honor in my life, God. Now you're asking for faith. Now you're asking in faith. I don't care what happens to me. My life is your life. I only have life because of you. Now you're in faith. 
Now you're in faith. And this I say, verse 17, that the law was 430 years later. Cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make a, the promise of no effect. So the law didn't come to nullify the promise. It says, for if, if the inheritance of the law, or if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. The inheritance. The inheritance of being the one that has the seed. The inheritance of the kingdom of God. Of being with God forever. Right? The inheritance of forgiveness. Is not nullified by the law. So here's, we, we take bits and pieces of, of, of God's word and, we, and we, we take a verse that will say, I'm no longer under the law, but Paul said it. I'm not under the law anymore, right? But here he's saying the law didn't nullify the promise. I'm not under the law, I'm under grace, I'm under the promise, I'm under the same promise as Abraham. Abraham wasn't under the law when he got the promise, I don't have to be under the law when I get the promise that's true. But the fact that the law didn't nullify the promise ought to get your attention too. Verse 19, what purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was appointed through angels and by the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. All right, so what's the purpose of the law? Why did it come? To let you know what you're doing wrong, right? If you go flying down the road, you ever been on a road, didn't have any speed limit signs, you just go, whew, just go, just go. All of a sudden there's a speed limit sign up there. You know you were going, you were speeding the whole time, right? You, you were speeding until the law showed up and put up the sign that told you what you were doing was wrong. But you were still wrong. You're still speeding. Now you know you're speeding, though. Now, now it's the, the teacher. We're going to see the tutor or the teacher. So it was there for transgression until the seed, the seed should come to whom the promise was made. So the promise was made to Jesus through Abraham, prophesied in the garden. And it was appointed through angels, the law, that is, was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. So the law didn't come just straight God to the people. It came through the angels to the mediator, Moses, and then was delivered to the, to the people. And Moses and Aaron were charged with teaching the people, teaching them the law. You, you, can't, you can't just write a law and expect everybody to follow it if they don't know what the law is. Right? You can't expect a person, they might, but you can't expect a person to go at a decent speed down a road if there's no sign to tell them you're speeding if you go too fa faster than this. You, you can't expect people to know the rules and regulations. You can't expect your kids to know what you expect of them unless you teach them what you expect of them. So Moses and Aaron were charged with this. Delivered by angels to Moses. And then from Moses to the people. Verse 21 says, is the law then against the promise of God? Certainly not. Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. There's not a law that gives life. 
There's not a single law that gives life. There's not an aspect of the law that gives them eternal life. Otherwise, you could be made righteous by following the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. All right, so the law comes from angels and a mediator down to the people. But the promise, who gave the promise? Showed up, talked to Abraham, right? Face to face. Abraham believed. Didn't have to have somebody teach him a bunch of stuff. Just says, get up, leave your family, leave your, leave your country, leave it all behind, and come where I'm going to direct you, where I'm going to take you to, and, and see this land that I'm going to give your descendants. See where your seed is going to go. But scripture can find everybody under, under sin. The Bible is very clear. Even their Bible, that was only the Old Testament. All have sinned. Everybody has sinned. Everybody needs this seed that's coming. David was not justified in the sight of God. He didn't, God didn't say of David, he's a man after my own heart because he followed the law. David was a murderer and, and an adulterer. He wasn't a man after God's own heart because he followed the law. He was a man after God's own heart because he sought after God. Because he spent time, even when he was wrong, even when he did wrong, he repented and he spent time with God, seeking him. Elijah wasn't righteous because he followed the law. Nobody in the Old Testament was, was declared righteous because they followed the law. Noah didn't find grace in the eyes of the Lord because he followed the law. The law wasn't even there yet. Abel's sacrifice wasn't more acceptable over Cain's because Abel was following the law. It was because Abel was seeking after God. Cain was looking to elevate himself. Man had become so corrupt, except for Noah, who was pure in all of his ways. It didn't mean he was a perfect man. It means his lineage was still pure. We're not made, we're not made righteous by the law. Made righteous by the promise. The promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. That promise that he was going to crush evil forever. Right? The serpent would bruise his heel, but he was going to crush his head. He was going to defeat it permanently, period. And as long as we live here, we live here in a fallen world, in a fallen state, still dealing with our own sins, still dealing with the sins of everyone around us who reject God. But one day we won't have that anymore. Now we're being sanctified, we're being set apart. Learning every day more and more how to trust in Jesus and trust in this promise and believe our faith grows more and more every day. But it's because of the promise, not because of the law. Verse 23, but before faith came, we were kept under, under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. For the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under the tutor. We're justified by faith. 
We're not justified by the tutor. We're not justified by the law. The law was here to teach us what's right and what's wrong. To clearly teach us what God's standard is. To point the way to the Messiah. To teach us how to conduct ourselves as we grow up. Isn't at some point our kids leave the house? Do they trust the things that we've taught them when they leave? Because when they leave, they're not under us anymore. They're not under the tutor anymore. Right? We're tutors to our children. We're teachers to our children. We, we push into them as much as we possibly can. When they leave, and hopefully they leave with faith, when they leave, has our word been trustworthy enough? Has our teaching been trustworthy enough that they go out and they understand, they know, they know that they can exist in this world, that they can, they can live in this world, they can conduct themselves in this world. Do they have faith in your words? And that's not a great measuring stick between having faith in your words and having faith in, in Jesus Christ. It's about the best I can come up with off the top of my head right now. So here's the deal. We're under the law. You're under the law until you're saved. But that law is there to teach you. But what saves you is faith in Jesus Christ. Because until that happens, all the law is is do's and don'ts. It looks like religion to everybody. If all we do is go around just teaching the law with no promise at the end of it, then what, what do, who has anything to look forward to? It's impossible to keep the law. If that's all the realization they come to, then they're not going to get saved. You've got to have the promise on there too. But here's the deal. With all promise and no law, they don't really know why they need the promise. They don't really know. Why do I need Jesus? Why do I need some guy to die on a cross for my sin? I, I don't sleep around with my wife, or on my, I don't sleep around with my wife. I don't sleep around on my wife. I mean, I'm not an adulterer. I didn't do that. I don't steal. I don't lie. I don't, you know, we name it all off. But Jesus took issue with that, didn't he? You heard it said, don't commit murder. You shall not kill. One of the Ten Commandments, right? But I'm telling you, if you have anger against your brother in your heart, you're already guilty of breaking that law. And now you can't stand in front of God. So you can't stand in front of God in your own righteousness. I've never committed adultery. I've never committed idolatry. You've never committed adultery? Really? What did Jesus say? It's not a matter of whether you commit it or not. If you look at a woman with lust for her, You've already committed adultery with her in your heart. Guilty. The sin is not the issue of your action. Sin is an issue of your heart. It's a matter of the heart. It's where it starts. The action comes after the sin is already committed in your mind. You're already determined to go there. And listen, maybe you never go there, but you live it in your head. Live it in your head. Think about it all the time. Can't tell you how many times I've probably committed murder in my heart this week. I can think of one specific time. And you know what's cool though? Because if you're if you're justified by faith, you hear it right away. It's murder. It's murder. I know, but man, Lord, didn't you kill him? Because I want him gone. I don't want him here. Take him out. Change him. Just get him to be quiet so I don't have to hear him anymore because he's, he's not being smart. He's being stupid and I don't want to hear it anymore. 
If I had my way, I'd knock him right through the wall. He said, I know, but that's murder. Now you need to repent. Now I need to repent. Did you hear what he said? Yeah, but you need to repent because you want to kill the guy. Yeah. I wouldn't kill the guy. Oh, I know you wouldn't, but you want to. That's enough. That's your heart, Glenn. That's your heart. You're going to deal with that right now. That guy doesn't belong to me. I don't, he doesn't belong to me. You do. I know, I'm wrong, right? Verse 26. For you are all sons of, the, sons of God through faith in, in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's then, uh, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You understand what that means? There is no social status for anybody anymore. Right? Across the board, believers, we don't have social status among ourselves. The promise isn't any more to me as a pastor than it is to you, whoever you are. Now, whatever God calls us to, responsibility comes with that, and so our responsibilities are different, but that doesn't establish us socially among one another. There's no more Jew or Greek. There's no more slave nor free. Male or female. You don't get to look down on one person or the other. Right? Men, we can't look at the wives and say they're less saved than us. Done deal's a done deal across the board. There's no racial divide. You know? if, if you won't share the love of Jesus with another person because of their race or their sex, then you don't have the love of Jesus anyways. You don't have it. We're all sons and daughters of God through faith in Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian, you have a problem with these basic differences in our lives, and that's some kind of great big dividing wall for you. You better get used to it, because if you're a believer and they're a believer, you're going to be living with each other in heaven for a long time. If you are Christ and you are Abraham's seed, you belong. You get the promise through Abraham because you believe in the seed, because you believe in Jesus Christ. So the promise is made through Abraham to the seed. If you believe in that seed, now you also belong to Abraham. You, you are his son or daughter by faith in Jesus Christ. very cool, isn't it? I mean, you know, you're not just blessed by Abraham because Jesus Christianity spread all over the place and came through the Jews and by through Abraham and it's much bigger than that. You belong to Abraham. You're part of his family. The Jews claim Abraham as their father. The Muslims claim Abraham as their father. Christians are just like, hey man, I believe in Jesus. You know, we can claim Abraham as our father. We have the right to do that. An Orthodox Jew that is not believer, he doesn't have the right to do that. That'd probably get me shot in Israel, but he doesn't have the right to do that. He's not a son, a true son of Abraham anymore. Muslim, I don't care if you can trace it back to Ishmael or not. You don't have the right to call yourself a son of Abraham if you're not a believer in the seed, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ. However, 
before you get down that dangerous road, you hang on to that little verse right there and you camp out on that verse right there and you just make yourself a duck and nobody else gets to pretty soon the church is replacing Israel and that's not true either Israel is still still his the apple of his eye he's coming back their time is going to be complete the time of their sin will be will be completed with the tribulation time the temple will be back in Jerusalem. The world economy for a thousand years will be shifted to Israel. We'll go to Jerusalem. We'll go see Jesus there. It's going to be an amazing thing. That's why we pray for them. We want their eyes to be open. We want as many... Do you know, understand, if a, if a, if a Jewish person is saved, they're part of the church, but they're also a son of Abraham, or a daughter of Abraham. That's how you get it. You get it by being circumcised, you get it by being saved. Circumcision is just an outward working of what was to take place inside. The cutting away of the secret flesh, the secret part of your body, cutting it away. Nobody else knows about it. It was to be a type of the circumcision of the heart, that cutting away of the secret things of your heart, letting God cut it away. That's what circumcision was supposed to be for. To set them apart to the promise of the seed, to the seed, not to the promise of the law. But these Judaizers had come into the church and they had made it something you had to do. And Paul's just saying, you already have the promise. You don't have to be circumcised to have the promise. You don't have to change your diet to have the promise. You have to believe in Jesus to have the promise. And that's all there is to it. But that's the beginning. There's more that comes after that. But you've got to have that. I'm not saved by works, right? As any man should boast. But right after that, we are his workmanship created to do good works in Christ. The works come after. And they're to be done in the name of Jesus. For him. Or they don't count. Burned up. They'll be burned up in the refining fire. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that this has been a clear message. Not something that confused and muddied up the water for anybody, but that it clear, clarified some things. Lord, if for no other reason we learn these things, even if we've already had a grasp on them, so that we can talk to To our friends and neighbors who are Jewish so they understand and maybe it's more so that we understand where they're coming from but Lord I would pray that these verses would not be something that would tear apart and put enmity or animosity between the church and Israel but Lord that these verses would just create a tighter bond in our hearts and a tighter longing for them to know their Messiah. A greater longing to see the day when their eyes are open. Lord, knowing that we've received the promise of your provision of forgiveness, that you took on the curse for us and became a curse for us, that you redeemed us and set us free from that, Lord, I pray that that would overwhelm all of us. And that would cause us, Lord, to look forward to your day, your return, your coming for us. Lord, I 
would pray that your church would not even just be excited that you're coming for us, but that that would mean the beginning of the final restoration of your people in Israel too. And there's so many reasons to be excited for your coming. But there's so many reasons to still be here. And we long for and we hope for, Lord, that you will come quickly. But until then, I pray, Lord, that you would give us vision and boldness and determination to be your people, to embrace the promise and to be determined to push that promise out to as many as possible, to deliver the gospel. Help us to stay focused on the mission as long as we're here, Lord, the mission to rescue more, The mission to bring glory, bring glory and honor to you no matter what we face, even if all around us reject you, Lord, that we would stand in the face of that, not budging, not wavering, bringing glory and honor to you. use us in these last days. Now, Lord, I pray that as we get ready to go our ways or whether we share this meal together, pray that you would bless our time, bless our fellowship. Lord, pour out your spirit even here. Just thank you and Lord, there are not enough words to honor. Lord, I pray for the men's dinner that's coming up, that that would be an, an outreach we don't even expect. That we would see men begin to take a stand for you. The men would give their lives to you. And for the baptism, Lord, and an outreach that it's becoming to a community, to a family. Again, Lord, we pray that we'll see lives changed. In Jesus' name, amen.